Hey guys, I'm Chris Buck, and you're very warm welcome to Friday Fretworks. And this week, we're taking a look at the somewhat forgotten but criminally underappreciated Filtertron pickup. Conception, the Gibson, or more specifically Seth Lover, designed the humbucking pickup with the PAF. But as Seth discovered way back in 1955 upon application for a patent, there had actually been six previous attempts. The first dating back to 1935 by piano makers Baldwin, who had designed such a device for their electric piano, although crucially they did suggest that it did have applications for other steel string instruments. As Seth Lover recalls, I had a hell of a time getting a patent. I finally got one with more or less one claim, that I'd invented a humbucking pickup. Now Seth's design centres around two coils with opposite magnetic polarity, connected in reverse so that the current went clockwise around one coil and anti-clockwise around the other. The coils were out of phase, as were the magnets, and the resulting pickup was in phase, meaning the 60 or 50 cycle ham was out of phase and thus cancelled, or maybe more appropriately, bucked. At the same time the Gibson were developing a humbucking pickup in Kalamazoo, electronics expert Ray Butts was developing a very similar concept in Nashville for guitar maker Gretsch. And Butts had moved from his native Illinois in 1954, hoping to interest the musicians of Nashville in his innovative new design, the Echo Sonic, the first ever guitar amplifier with a built-in tape delay. Now, he only ever made 60 or so of these amps, but they were incredibly influential. One of them found their way into the hands of Chet Atkins, whilst another found its way to Sam Phillips, meaning that pretty much every track that Scotty Moore ever played on for Elvis Presley featured the Echo Sonic. The technology later worked its way into one of the most famous Echo units of all time, the Echoplex. Now, for much the same reason that Gibson struggled with the hum and electronic interference caused by their single coil P90, Chet Atkins, upon loving Rory Butt's Echo Sonic amplifier, asked him if he would be interested in designing a humbucking pickup. And as Ray recalls, Chet asked me, why don't you make a humbucking pickup? I knew about the concept from working with transformers, and Ampex used the humbucking principle in pickups of their tape recorder heads. It wasn't a new idea, and it's a very simple principle. Now, Butt's design was largely very similar to Gibson's humbucker, although tonally is very, very different. This primarily comes down to its difference in size. Of course, the Filtertron had to fit into the diamond shaped hole the pickups the Gretsch were using at the time. Now, tonally, they are quite different, as I said, and this primarily comes down to the fact that the two bobbins are much smaller and subsequently are closer together in a Filtertron, meaning that you're taking a sample of sound from a much shorter stretch of string, giving the Filtertron a little bit more of a defined, kind of jangly edge over your kind of typical PAF. To my ear, at least, the transients from a Filtertron are a little bit more pointed, a little bit more sharp, I guess, than the archetypal PAF, and subsequently it does seem as though there is a little bit more clarity. Now for this next clip, the Flame Top Yamaha Revstar is going to have a set of Radio Shop PAF type pickups, whilst the Black Revstar has a set of Lolotrons. We're going to compare and contrast now, just to give you an idea of how drastically different they can sound.
Ray Butts applied for a patent in 1957 and it was finally granted in 1959, although in the summer NAM of 1957, when Gretsch unveiled their new Filtertron pickup, a few stores across Gibson unveiled their new humbucking pickup. Gretsch filtered the hum, Gibson bucked it. Two entirely different designs with the same objective, designed entirely independently, pretty much simultaneously. Really is amazing. As I mentioned, to this point you've been hearing a set of Lollatrons, the Lollas take on the Filtertron, fitted to my black Yamaha Revstar 720. Although it is interesting to note that prior to 2003, when Gretsch were taken over by Fender, Filtertrons hadn't really, for the most part, made their way outside of Gretsch hollow bodies, which may go some way towards explaining why they're not as common as their PAF counterpart. But post-2003, they've become increasingly frequent, notably in Telecasters, as with this Squire Cabernita that I'm playing here at Download Festival in 2016 with Buccaneers. <laughs> recent times, after years of TV Jones being pretty much the only option if you wanted a set of Filtertron style pickups without a Gretsch guitar attached, it's interesting to see that pickup makers the world over have started to throw their hat into the ring. Everyone from Lola to Seymour Duncan, Radio Shop and McAnally, it's a whole host of fantastic pickup makers making really cool variations on a theme and hopefully it'll lead to a bit of a resurgence in this style of pickup. Honestly shooting this video has just served to remind me how cool they can sound and honestly how unique. They're nowhere near as you ubiquitous as their PAF counterpart, but they're jangly, there's a top-end snarl which is incredibly distinctive, and honestly it really is easy to see why they've found favour with so many great players over the years. Obviously Chet Atkins, to Brian Setzer, George Harrison, Malcolm Young obviously put them to great use, Pete Townsend, Billy Duffy, Billy Gibbons, Chris Cornell, a whole host of great players have found favour with them, and honestly if you ever get a chance to try a set out, I implore you to at least give them a go, they really are something special. As ever, I'm Chris Buck, you're watching Friday Fretworks, thank you very much for watching. Please do subscribe and hit the bell icon if you haven't already. See you next week for another video. Cheers guys, take care, I'll see you soon.